If I could capture love's most secret potion, of Cupid's arrows dipped in devotion, I would compose the sweetest poem and I would give it all to you. If I could enlist words oh so profound, an exquisite mixture of precious sound to paint the picture of a foolish clown, please know, I would give it all to you. Hi, my name is Mr. G and I am a poet. As you may well gather, I don't just walk around speaking like this for the hell of it. You know? <laughs> but like a lot of people ask me, you know, oh, what's it like being a poet? What's it like being a poet? And I guess it's, it's kind of like being like an ancient troubadour. You, know, you sort of like go up and down the country searching for metaphors, right? Just searching for the meaning of things and that kind of stuff. So I'm literally that guy. I'm have poems, will travel, right? Um, and I'm so glad to be here, so glad to be in Brighton. Uh, I love it here. Really, really great city. Um, I like coastal towns. I like coastal towns a lot because um, being from London, I still can't get over the fact that land might end. Yeah? <laughs> and I remember like the first time I came down, the first time I went down, was it, was it Queen Street or something like that? Like, um, just walking down, walking down, walking down, and I hit the waterfront and I saw the ocean. I was like, wow, man. The rain hits this place hard. <laughs> but what I'm here to talk to you about is what I call the religion of rehabilitation. I, I've been doing this poetry game for a very, very long time, like a real, real, real long time. Like, <laughs> like before social media, before YouTube, like when I started, Biker Grove was still on TV, right? You know? <laughs> Young guys is going, bike or what? You know? um, but no, no, no. I, I started off and I, I started off in Brixton just doing like little open mics and stuff like that. And I gained like a little notoriety and people started to get to know my name. It was mainly word of mouth back then. And what I found myself happening was that I was then getting invited to then do workshops. And I'd never done a workshop before, right? This person said, oh, I really like the way you speak, the way you put things together. You know, I've got a group of kids that would just love to hear the way you speak. And I was like, okay, right, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I'll never forget my first workshop. It was, it was life-changing in many, in many of effects. Um, it was in this school in South London, and the school was on the edge of this estate. And so you literally had to walk past drug dealers to get into the school, right? There were guys outside there that would just be on these like mopeds, just doing wheelies, and they had loads of phones and loads of jewelry and loads of you know, designer garments. And you had to just walk past these guys to, to get into the school. And a lot of the guys that were outside the school, they were kids that had been excluded from the school. So all the kids in the school knew them, you know? And they would just like, just, just, just run game on you. They'd be like, oh, you guys are idiots going in there. You'd be out here getting this money, whatever, all that kind of stuff, right? And so, you know, you just walk past this thinking, whoa, this place is different, right? And so the essence of the project was, it was like a 10-week project. And what we had to do is we had to compose and create a piece of art which would then form part of a show which the then mayor of London, Ken Livingston, that's how far back it is, um, would, would then go and see. So I was there with a group of like about 25 kids, you know, and they, I go, how many people here write poetry? And they all put their hand up, right? And they go, okay, you know, let's hear some of your poetry. And it was all about, you know, I got guns, I got girls, I got this, I got that. Da, 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 da. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we need to pause on this one here, right? And because they were all speaking from what I call the MC narrative, right? And the MC narrative always deals with what I call the, the first person. So it very much is about. I've got this, I don't have this. I do this, I don't do that. This is me, this is not me. And then when you put that kind of narrative in the minds of like 12, 13 year olds, it very easily goes into what I call bragging and boasting. And so I was trying to like get them away from all that. But this group were like slick. They were like real, they would listen to everything you say and they would challenge you. And there was one kid called Michael and he used to challenge me all the time. You know, he used to say like, oh, hey, you know, Mr. G, how come you don't write gun bars? How come you don't write about gangsters? How come you don't write about knifing, all these type of things, being on road, the man name? How come you don't write those type of bars, right? And I said, well, you know, you can only write the truth that's true to you. And so my impression 
of a bad man and your impression of a bad man might be very, very different. I said, you're a young dude, so for you, the bad men are those guys you see hanging outside your school. But for me, I'm an old dude. The bad men I knew, they got locked up in the 80s, got out in the 90s. Locked up in the 90s, got out in the noughties. Those who were still locked up in the noughties, now they found Jesus, you know? Right? <laughs> That's my impression of a bad man, you know what I mean, right? I know a bigger journey for them, you know? And so these guys, they liked listening to the way in which I vocalized, right? The way in which I put things together. And so we were like going like week 10, week 9, week 8, week 7. We're just starting to piece together lots of pieces of work. And what happens is we started to get a high dropout rate because some people just weren't interested in the whole idea. If like, if I can't spit bars, I'm not interested. So they wanted to move away. But there's one kid, Michael, I remember like he was sharp, sharp, and he was always picking my brain, picking my brain. And one time, I wanted to, him to write a poem about love. And he didn't want to do it, man. He's like, ah, oh, I can't write about love. Gee, I can't do it, I can't do it, man. You know, I just, I, I've got nothing to say about love. And so I thought, okay, let me describe love to you this way. Imagine that life is like a football field and you've got like the four goal posts. No, the four cor corner posts. So you've got two corner posts ahead of you, two corner posts behind you. Ahead of you, you could say one corner post is the love and respect that people give to you. Another corner post is the love and respect that you give to people. And behind you is the love and respect that people deny you. And behind you is the love and respect that you deny people. And you're constantly playing this game of football, just, just moving around from different parts of the, of the field, forwards, backwards, you know, midfield, defense, striking, right, in an attempt to score a goal. Now, you can focus in your own half, you know, stay in your own half, and you can operate there and just deal with the denial of life. And there's a possibility you might even score a goal from your own half. But in order to move forward, you've got to focus on the giving aspect of life. And that way, you can just forget about the denial and forget about acting on the defensive and step forward and understand the love and respect that you are giving and that you are receiving, and hopefully you might be able to achieve your goals. When I put that in his mind, he was like, Whew. real, real, real excited. And he went away and he wrote an amazing poem, fantastic poem. And we went and performed it, and the mayor loved it. And it was like, like that really inspired me. It really it gave me like a, a lovely feeling of accomplishment. You know, I felt like, you know, my words are connecting. And so I then carried on being a poet. I had a little bit of success, you know, a few series on Radio 4. I was the support act for Russell Brand, touring up and down the country, all over the world. I was starred in a West End show, just being all poetical and stuff like that. And I was, you know, generally enjoying life. But I didn't feel that same kind of, like, fulfillment in what I was doing than when I was doing those workshops. So one day, a friend of mine, he was an actor, and he invited me to come to Feltham Youth Offenders Institution to go and do a workshop with the inmates there. Now, I've never done a workshop in a prison before. Like, I've gone to visit someone in prison before, but that's kind of different, right? Like, going to visit someone in prison is like, like going to visit someone in the hospital, right? Like, you go there, it's kind of awkward, you don't really want to be there, but once you sit down and you're opposite someone, they know why you're there, you know why they're there, you bring the grapes, you just start talking about old times, everything's good, right? <laughs> And you ain't worried about the other wards and this person farting in this bed over here, do you know what I mean? And this person coughing up in that bed over there. You don't care. If you're honest, right? When you go to hospital, you just go visit the person you know. And that's what it's like going to visit someone in prison. You just go to visit the person that you know. But then, when you do a workshop in front of folks, it's a totally different scenario. Because I was there in front of like 30 guys, and I'm looking out at them, and the majority of them are black. The majority of them are in there for drug crimes gun crimes, knife crimes. The majority of them are from play areas that I know. And I'm looking around, looking around, and this is a few years later, and I see one familiar face. I see that same kid, Michael, from my first workshop. And I was just like, what is, is, I know you. And like, you know when someone's different? Because back then he was a little kid, like all giddy and stuff like that, and happy, right? You know, just kicking football in the park. Now he's a man, now he's built voice deeper, taller, eyes colder. And he just looked at me, and then suddenly he recognized me, and I could just for a brief moment see the little boy inside him. And I was like, oh no, oh man, 
What happened to you, man? What happened? What happened in the last six or seven years I've seen you? And he'd killed two people, right? He got involved in some gang stuff, ended up killing one guy. He then went inside. That gang drama followed him inside. He then killed someone else, and he was awaiting trial for the second murder. And inside, he was like the don. He was like a kingpin, right? People come and bring him drinks and stuff like that. He could click his fingers, everything happened. And just seeing that broke my heart. Because I was thinking to myself, wow, the, the love and respect that you never got on the outside world, you're getting it in here. And the love and respect that you never gave in the outside world, you're giving it in here. So my whole football field scenario, in a way, prison's almost like the logical choice for you, right? And it just totally blew my mind. It totally like wrecked my spirit, right? And I started doing a lot of work. I went and volunteered with National Prison Radio. They do shows, um, they broadcast shows to 80 different prisons up and down the UK. I started really getting involved in what I call the rehabilitation process, right? And that's when I started to realize that rehabilitation, it's, it has to be like a religion, right? Because you're there faced with people that have committed crimes that are heinous, like crimes that your internal moral register just is repulsed by, but you've got to say to yourself, is this person beyond being rehabilitated? Does this person not deserve a chance to be rehabilitated? There's a mechanism that leads you into prison. Is there a mechanism to get you out of prison? But as we well know, the statistics are terrible, right? Within the first year, one in four inmates that are released are likely to reoffend and be back inside. In general, recidivism, which is reoffending, is 80%. So 80% of the people who go out, they're going to come back in again, right? Within jail, you are 10 times more likely to commit suicide. So in a way, it's dangerous to be in jail, right? Jails are killing us. Now, I know that behind every crime is a victim. And I know that there are two families that are crying over what Michael did. But I also feel in my heart that I still remember that somewhere inside him, I have to believe that there is that little boy, that there is something that can be salvaged so that when he comes back out into society, because everyone who we say, okay, lock him up, you know, throw away the key, right? These folks are going to be out in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time, and they will have to be part of our society again. And if the olive branch isn't there to lead them back into society, then there's no point in us talking about utopia and wonderland and all these type of things. We may as well just create our utopia and create a prison 20 times bigger because we'll just be farming young men in there, in there, in there, and literally forgetting about them. And so that's kind of the feeling that I have about what I call my religion, and that's the religion of rehabilitation. And so I want to finish with a poem that is dedicated to the memory of Michael. And so this poem is called Living on a Knife's Edge. There's a delicate balance of what follows fashion. As peer pressure unravels an adolescent pattern, you and your friends all like to ride bikes, and we did too. You like to sport the latest hairstyle that you like, and we did too. And we know that all teenage boys are going to fight, and we did too. And you think you were the first to carry a knife? Well, back in the day, we did too. Ah, this is where the problem lies. But this is the question that plagues younger minds. It's all too easy for older generations to confer and surmise that the violence of today never occurred in their times, but things have changed. Heavier drugs are being blazed. Perceptions are rearranged. Strange wars are being waged around the planet, sending the message that if you want it, then grab it. The pen may be indeed mightier than the sword, but the sword makes its point sweetly doing damage. Such is the delicate balance that translates into high streets. This world is ruled by the mighty, and no one admires the weak. No one admires defeat. This world won't be inherited by the meek. So violence is the language that we all reliably speak. As every day we seek headlines of sensationalized crimes. As newspapers offer up more space to advertise. As a campaign issue it's hot and even politicians realize there's more to the pressure in the pot that takes so many lives and makes so many mothers cry. And scream the question why? Was it their child on that night in that fight that had to die? And die for what? Some trivial misunderstanding that could easily be stopped? Some argument fueled when tempers run hot or over what someone's got or false pride that's being mocked so the outcome was the fist fight or the night sky being ignited by a gunshot. That person's got the latest iPhone, see? And I want one too. That person's got a father in their family and I want one too. 
That person's got oil in their country, and I want some too. You say you've got hatred for me? Well, I've got some too. There's a delicate balance over what follows fashion. As peer pressure unravels an interesting pattern, an interesting challenge on how we choose to live our lives. Are we floating peacefully on the wings of a dove, or are we all perched weeping on the edge of a knife? Thank you.